you fell asleep in your costume again. It might have mattered long ago. Long ago you might have been relieved to transform out of it after a hard day's work. You might have been relieved to get back to your normal life, as a normal girl with normal problems. After a while, you just stop caring. The costume stays on. You don't even sleep much anymore. Only in the times when your body finally decides to shut down. Or at least until you realize that you've gone for so long without rest that you were only shooting up hallucinations. Days aren't that much important anymore. You keep asking for the assignments, even the horrible ones. The ones that even that pocky filleting bitch wouldn't take. You look like shit, you feel like shit, and for the second time this week, you've forgotten what your name was. It's at the tip of your tongue, if your mouth didn't taste like blood and stale alcohol at the moment. What do you call yourself? Hopefully not something stupid again. Mommy never really got over how you started calling yourself that name again. Shiaki Matsuda? That kind of sounds stylish. A bit too cute for you. But hell, you've called yourself worse before. Other people have called you worse before. The other names that floated up sounded a bit too silly. Maybe next time, if you wake up forgetting everything again. You try to smile at yourself. Not much of an improvement, but it'll do. Your shield thing. You don't really know what to call it, but you know it's heavy, and you could probably do some damage if you smash someone over the head with it. It's constantly clicking inside, like a bomb, but you're not too worried about it exploding. Upon closer inspection, it looks like it's seen better days. There's a large gash in the middle, like someone had taken an industrial saw to it and tried to cut it in half. The jewel in the center is cracked, and it's showing some of the clicking gears inside. What are you, Captain America or something? What? Stars and stripes? You're not Captain America. You're not even American. Stop mucking around. You'd probably hurt yourself trying to. You jiggle with it a bit. It turns slightly, but the gears clicking relentlessly within start to protest loudly, so you leave it alone. You know it'll go away if you cancel your transformation, but you don't feel like it at the moment. You think about how much more awesome Iron Man is than Captain America. The alcoholism isn't too hot, but hey, you're already down that road anyway. You check your inventory. You have two small canisters of regular painkillers, enough for four doses. An opened pack of cigarettes, two of which have already been smoked, a metal Zippo lighter, which you managed to light after nearly dropping it, curiously, two crumpled up $100 bills, your trusty combat knife still strapped to your ankle. Oh, and your clamshell cell phone. It seems to be fully charged and in an annoying pink color. From the screen, you could see that you have two messages. You light up one first before reading. It doesn't help the horrible taste in your mouth much, but it calms you down at least. If there were any laser traps to avoid, this'd be handy too. You open up your message inbox. The first message comes from a sender registered to your contacts as QB. The other is from an unregistered number. Strangely enough, your phone is devoid of anything except these two new messages and what appears to be five contacts. There is a diary function, but it's kept locked away by a five-letter password. You leave it alone for now. You read the messages. The message from QB reads, Make your way to Mommy's apartment as soon as you wake up. Short, terse, commanding. Annoying little parasite. You remember not liking it, and even in your slightly confused state, you don't think that's going to change anytime soon. The message from the unregistered number is stranger. Let it go. Seriously, it's time to move on. You have no idea what they're talking about, or who it's from. Maybe it's just spam, or a message wrongly sent to your number. Nothing significant, you decide. 
Biting into the filter of your nearly spent cigarette, you stab out a couple of choice expletives from your admittedly limited repertoire as a reply to QB. Quickly accessing the draw function of your phone, you scrawl out something offensive and send it as an attachment. It's immature and puerile, but you're not in the best of moods. It felt good sending it in any case. After a while, you call one of the registered numbers in your contact list. The other end of the line rings a few times before it is picked up. Hello? Who is this? A warm, familiar voice comes on, slightly hesitant. I don't have your number on my contact list. I'm sorry. May I know who's on the line? She seems to be alright, much to your relief. It's great to hear her voice, even if it sounds like she's hesitant to receive your call. You manage to murmur your new name after a few unsuccessful tries. Your throat is dry, and painfully so. And there's silence at the other end for a few moments before Mommy's voice comes on again, all warmth and honey now. Chiaki? That's a surprisingly pretty name, and I think it's much better than your last one. Murder face doesn't really suit you. She giggles slightly before concern seeps into her voice. Are you sure you're all right, or... Er Chiaki-san? You sound a bit hoarse. He pauses as a muffled voice speaks in the background. Oh, um, Kyube says to come on over so we can give you your assignment for today. He sounds a bit grumpy today, for some reason, although you can never really tell with him, can you? Another pause. Chiaki-san, have you had breakfast yet? I'll set an extra place if you haven't. That's no answer, Chiaki-san. You should eat better. Mommy's voice becomes chiding as always. You shouldn't be drinking so much, and the pills you've been taking... I know you're getting all the tough assignments, but please take care of yourself. You mumble something resembling an assent. If it was someone else, you'd tell them to take a long walk off a pier wearing cement shoes. But it's Mommy. Can't do that to her. I'll make sure there's enough left for you when you get here, then. No, I'm alone here with Kyuve. Why did you ask, Chiaki-san? You mumble something else and try to end the call there. Mommy lets out a sigh before she bids you goodbye. I'll wait for you then, Chiaki-san. See you. The call ends, and you stash your cell phone back into your inventory. That went better than you expected it to. You decide to get yourself ready, just in case. It doesn't hurt to prepare, and you know you're absolute shit with your knife at any capacity. As if responding to your thoughts, the heavy shield clamped to your arm clicks a few times, before turning a couple of dozen degrees, locking into place with a clack of metal, reverting back to its old position. Automatically, you reach behind it and feel the handle of an oversized gun fall heavily into your grip. It's a heavy son of a bitch, and you draw it out. It's not a gun, it's a hand cannon. It's seen better days, sure, but it looks functional. The shield doesn't give you a reload, but at least the chambers are full. Eight shots worth. You remember then that the shield has always given you strange things to work with. Sometimes it gives you hardware that's easily familiar. Other times it's given you strangely shaped ones that nearly break your wrist after every discharge and have prayer papers affixed to every available surface. In any case, you have a gun, now. You stash it into your inventory and make your way to Mommy's apartment. At least you remember the way, even if you can't remember what the hell your real name is. Even before you approach the front door, you realize that something is wrong. The sound of screaming inside is muffled but clear, interrupted by the dulled thump of what sounds like concussive blasts of force. You can also hear breaking furniture and glass inside. Things sure went from nice to fucked in a hurry. Wasting no time, you draw your pistol from your inventory, before rearing up with one heeled foot and smashing it into the locked front door. The wood immediately gives way, splintering under the force, and you immediately grasp your firearm with both hands, one steadying the other, accommodating its weight. With trigger discipline, of course. As you enter, the apartment is dimly lit. Strange because you remember that Mommy never closes her blinds. She likes the sunlight to come in from the windows, and she isn't too well with the dark. 
The sharp stench of blood is all over, and as you step forward cautiously, you become increasingly aware that you're stepping in incubator flesh. You call out Mommy's name, feeling increasingly horrified at every passing moment. The entire apartment is now deathly silent and totally dark. There is no response. You remind yourself that yelling out Mommy's name over and over again isn't going to help, and you bite down on the impulse to do so. Venturing further into the apartment, both hands gripping the oversized gun tightly, you will yourself to move as silently as possible. At the very least, you'll hear the hypothetical knife before it slid into your back. Your eyes beginning to adjust to the darkness, you can somewhat make out shapes now, and avoid walking into walls or stubbing your toes into furniture. Keeping your pistol aimed forward, you spy a huddled shape near the doorway leading to the kitchen, while you hear more scuffling and more screaming above you. Upstairs where Mommy's room is. There's no time to waste on the huddled shape by the kitchen, and you're not going to damage more of Mommy's apartment if you can help it. You move as quickly and as quietly as you can upstairs, nearly slipping on a few steps, but managing to keep your footing. You realize that whatever's got Mommy in her room has left a blood trail, or worse, it's actually hers to begin with. As you approach the door to Mommy's room, only at the last second do you sense someone just about to stab you in the back, the gleam of a knife catching your glasses in the dim light. Someday, Someone will manage to kill you, put a bullet in your head, shove ten inches of tempered steel right through your spine. You're not particularly concerned how. All you know is that it will not be today. Letting your left hand come away with the gun, you spin around to smash your shield into the knife. You feel the blade skitter across the jagged scar of the otherwise smooth surface of the device, sparks flying at the contact and it's with a clatter that you hear the sharp implement fall to the floor. Immediately you lunge forward, right hand managing to grab a handful of garments, and you drag whoever it is to the floor with you. A moment's worth of mutual cursing, kicking and struggling, and you end up on top, gun firmly nudging your captive's chest. Oh, get off! You smell like booze! Get off, goddammit! You recognize that voice and it's suddenly clear that you've grabbed someone's cape. White, long, and somewhat bloody. It's Sayaka, you stupid bitch! Get off of me! Mommy son's in danger! And point that thing somewhere else, for fuck's sake! Your blood rushing at this unexpected, adrenaline-filled altercation. You resist the temptation of pistol-whipping her across the face, and instead settle for calling her a cunt under your breath for nearly stabbing you in the back. You ask, in a louder voice, just what's happening is you both stand up and compose yourselves. I heard that, and no, I don't have any fucking clue. I just... Sayaka gulps audibly as she looks at the door to Mommy's room before shaking her head. I just stopped by because Kyube was going to give me another assignment. It was like this when I got here, and I tried to get to Mommy, but something was... Hey, wait! Wait a second! You've heard enough. Turning your back on your fellow magical girl, you immediately make to force Mommy's door open. Wait a second, you fucking booze head! We don't know what's in there! You tell her to fuck off. You've always wanted to do that. The door comes away in your second kick, and light floods your eyes. Bright, blinding light, coming from the muzzle flash of Mommy's rifles at the far corner of the room. She's clamping one bloody hand at her side, slumped against the wall firing off and discarding the rifles erected in front of her, discharging them at something from across the room. You immediately recognize it for what it is. A witch. A freshly turned monstrosity, still humanoid in form. A witch hat jauntily perched on its darkened skull, its flamboyant outfit dripping ichor, two oversized pistols of strange origin jutting out from its clawed hands. Its head snaps up at your approach, and it smiles at you. You feel the shield heat up at its attention, and the muted clicking inside the device seemed to grow louder. Springing forward and interposing yourself between Mommy and the Witch, you aim the hand cannon one-handedly at the warp-touched figure. It repeats the name with much more relish, seemingly cackling at you. Shiaki-san, get back! I'll handle this! You 
barely hear Mommy from the deafening report of her rifles, but even if he could, he definitely wouldn't have followed that order. This witch needed to die, and if it had to take you breaking its face with the gun after you've emptied all eight rounds into it, then so be it. At this, the clicking inside your shield stops, and it turns a complete 180 degrees, locking into place with a crunching of gears and the slap of metal upon metal. The world immediately turns gray, stopping completely, utterly. A dull iron cast covering everything, freezing everything in time, including the witch. But instead of the twisted evil being you saw shambling towards Nami, you see only a young woman with her blonde hair tied into twin tails, holding onto two pistols, scared out of her wits, staring at you as if you were death itself, silently pleading to be saved. The witch's mark engraved brightly on her forehead. Your eyes narrow behind your glasses as you glare at the witch's mark. It meant that this was no mere accident or turning. Someone had planned this. A setup that pretty much resulted in Mommy bleeding out and you without the breakfast you've been promised. Stepping forward, you press the mouth of your gun directly upon the mark, right at the center of the twin-tailed girl's forehead. You can almost hear her whimper at this tears welling up in her eyes and falling out, only to be frozen in the air moments later, glistening. Long ago, you probably would have hesitated. You'd have cared to ask who sent her, or tried to find some way to help. You were looking forward to pancakes, you murmur instead, before pulling the trigger. The gun kicks in your hand as the hammer blasts forward, igniting the powder, sending the round careening through the barrel punching through skin, bone, and brain. The entry wound is insultingly small for such a caliber, but the exit wound is a blossoming flower of flesh and blood at the back of the girl's head, frozen in time. The world resumes its pace, the gray filter lifting, and you close your eyes from the sight of the witch eroding into nothing from the feet up. Leaving behind a single grief seed, its spine embedded into the floor. Chiaki-san? Mommy's voice comes around, and you turn to glance at her. She's still bleeding, but it seems that Sayaka's tending to her injuries at the moment. I... I'm sorry, I didn't... You shake your head, and make to stash your weapon away when you hear a familiar voice. Not in your ear, but in your mind, like a splinter in your brain, interrupting your thoughts. You're late. What's your excuse? The white furry creature or rather, a horde of it, scampers into the room, fourteen pairs of eyes swiveling to look up at you. They all seem to be chewing something. Also, what is this curious creature you drew a picture of? Dick butt? You're suddenly very tired. You let the incubator stew in silence as you sharply nudge up the grief seed into the air with the toe of your shoe, catching it with your free hand and pressing it against your soul gem purifying the roiling darkness inside it, before tossing the bauble aside where it's caught by one of the cubes milling around. Asshole. The incubators look up at you, before giving a collective shake of their heads in perfect synchronization. Silent as always. I don't know what goes on in your head, but your tardiness almost got Tomoe Mami killed. I do hope you reflect on that. No, it's not her fault. We didn't know. Nami protests, wincing at Sayaka's crude application of bandages. It seems that whatever it was had clawed her side open, but thankfully they were merely flesh wounds and nothing more. Sayaka-chan, it's okay. Thank you. You shouldn't coddle a junior like her, you know. Kibe now chides the blonde magical girl. We found her in the middle of nowhere, with no memory of who she was. She should at least learn to be disciplined. She's a good girl, Mommy insists, wincing as she now stood up. And and she's gonna help me clean up, and after that, I'll get her the breakfast she came here for. Right, Chiaki-san? She smiles at you, right despite the bloodstains on her face, and the state of her own apartment. Sayaka glowers at you as you return that smile as best you can, which isn't much, even by your standards. Kyube lets out a sigh. Very well. Go and do your things. You. The massive crimson eyes swivel back to focus at you. 
Get your assignment dossier from Sayaka afterwards. And please, try not to kill anyone important this time. I'll... I'll go look and see what caused this. Stupid dickbutt rodent bastard. You'll kill him permanently one of these days. One of the Cubays suddenly bursts into bloody chunks following a deafening pistol report, and you blink as Mommy, Sayaka, and the remaining incubators turn to look at you while you're surreptitiously stashing your gun back into your inventory. You shrug. You have an apartment to clean all of a sudden, and a reward of pancakes to earn.